I was hoping to have some uh, images that I don't have today. Is Romero uh, Gomez here? Romero here? There he is. Okay, I'm going to be talking about Romero's art. Um, we'll provide opportunity <laughs> for you to see them later. Uh, this has been a great day for me today. I'm always humbled and honored uh, to be witness to the intellectual, the artistic, uh, the political, and the spiritual greatness of, of Chicano culture. And I, I say that everywhere I go in the world. Uh, I, I've told people I want inscribed on my tombstone uh, everything I needed to know I learned in East L.A. <laughs> and the, the reason for that, uh, I think, is evident in the discussions you've heard today and what you see in this amazing exhibit across the way. Most art exhibits show a lot of created objects but they don't pay much attention to the creative act. And the effort to document the work that goes into creating things, the willingness that's required uh, to put images out there and try to turn, use cultural forms of expression to try to turn segregation into congregation, to try to uh, use art in public space to create new publics is an extraordinary thing. And it's a true, the fact that we're, we're viewing it and the broader exhibit of, set of exhibits of which it's a part that for maybe the first time honor uh, appropriately the multilingual, multinational, multiracial history of art in Los Angeles is a tremendously important thing. What's important about it to me most of all is, uh, is this issue of willingness. Some years ago, there was an interview with Louis Armstrong, and the journalist said, isn't it, basically said to Louis, isn't it a drag to play with people who aren't as talented as you are? Because if you're Louis Armstrong, everybody's not as talented as you are. And Armstrong said, that's the wrong way to think about it. He says, when I play with people, I don't listen for their virtuosity. I can hear willingness in what they play. And so a willingness, an attentiveness, a belief in the worthiness of your own work matters a lot. And it makes everybody's art and life better if we can be attentive to uh, the importance of willingness. Chicano art and culture for so long has uh, enabled me to hear willingness. I hear it in the spoken word art of Maricela Norte, in the music of Ruben Guevara and Las Trace and Quetzal, in the performances of Chicano uh, Secret Service. Uh, you could hear willingness in this art so powerfully and so prominently. But I also think what we're seeing today is that you can learn to see willingness as well. In the paper dresses of Diane Gamboa that have a short life because they're made of paper, but they go out in the world and they do unexpected work. The willingness of, uh, of low riders and, and zoot suitors, the willingness of people dancing the Capredita wearing uh, Stetsons and Ray-Bans and uh, Koreas with their home state in Mexico uh, attached to their bodies, in the bakery calendars that uh, circulate. Uh, you can see willingness in that amazing sign on Whittier Boulevard uh, announcing a business that is both a muffler shop and a chess club. I think it's the only one in the world. And that sign itself shows um, a daring, a, um, a crossing of boundaries, a, a belief that we can make anything uh, that we want it to be. And we can laugh at ourselves and we can use humor as a way to uncrown power. But down deep, uh, something really serious is going on. And of course, that seriousness haunts us as we have this exhibit, which in some ways is a triumph of, the, of 30 years of work done by people in this room to uh, demand honor and respect for the cultural creativity of an aggrieved population. But we know that this honor comes in a moment of terrible danger, that this is no ordinary time. We're in the middle of something that isn't a momentary wave of hatred of immigrants. It's not a momentary downturn in the economy. It's a deadly brew of institutional racism and recreational hate. It's a poisonous mixture uh, of uh, a, a, an elite that recognizes that it has made wages so low, that it has distributed 
distributed wealth so badly that in fact the kind of demand-based economy uh, that a, a working class and middle class America once experienced is never coming back. And this is not a temporary crisis that we're undergoing. We're undergoing a chaotic systemic breakdown that over the next 25 years will demand the most uh, from us. And it's precisely, I think, because of the severity of that, that it, uh, it haunts, I think, our discussions of this art. It's, well, how can we look at, at these images in the wake of the developments in Escondido, California, or Hazleton, Pennsylvania, that are designed to deny access to housing and to municipal space to uh, people of Mexican uh, origin uh, by uh, presuming that they, are, they belong uh, somewhere else. We, of course, everyone in this room is familiar with the psychosis in the state of Arizona that on the one hand says it's so important that people be treated as individuals that the state outlaws the teaching of La Raza ethnic studies in the schools in Tucson and other places in Arizona because it's so important to be an individual. But the same legislature passes a bill that says people are so much part of groups that all Mexicans can be racially profiled and rousted by the police and sweated because one is as good as another. So individualism is tremendously important in the one case when it advantages whiteness, it's no longer important uh, when it might defend the dignity and, and the uh, self-respect uh, 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 of, uh, of, of Chicanos. In Arizona, you have a situation where violating the law is shown as so bad that police officers are asked to stop uh, a fighting violent crime and spend their attention becoming volunteer immigration officers because the law is so important. But on the other hand, the law is not so important that white homeowners uh, are uh, held accountable for not paying Social Security, not paying minimum wage. In fact, uh, Arizona's uh, employer sanctions bill explicitly uh, exempted uh, people who hire nannies and gardeners and domestics. In other words, a direct subsidy for, for white privilege. I think we reach this level of hypocrisy only at a moment of deep structural breakdown. And at a time like this, art has something to say. Because art is one of those unexpected alternative institutions where it's possible to deepen the capacity for action and awareness, deepen the democratic possibilities of low-wage working uh, people, uh, people who have to make the, the, the transition that my, 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 my dear late colleague Clyde Woods used to call the battle uh, in the face of survival and subsistence to move to affirmation and resistance. And in the face of this kind of, uh, uh, of difficulty, the fights over space are tremendously important. In order for history to take place, it takes places. In order for people who have been displaced and dispossessed and disinherited, and as Dave Rodiger says, just plain dissed, for people like that who have been displaced, action in space matters a lot. Art that takes up space, that penetrates into space, that asserts people's right to travel anywhere, to live anywhere, uh, to create community where they want to create it, whether it's on the concert stage or in a, a, a backyard uh, 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 party on, in city terrace. These fights over space are directly related to the whole future of cultural creation. And they manifest what my colleague Gay Johnson calls the struggle for spatial entitlement. Uh, Gay's work goes back to the 40s and traces 70 years of black and Chicano interaction in LA. Uh, people who have often been pitted against each other, but on the other hand have a linked fate because of their exposure to residential segregation, to territorial punitive uh, policing, uh, because to secondary, second class uh, discount education. And because these similar but not identical experience with space have made space and race uh, relate to each other, Gay shows that they've developed an imagination about space that tries to fight back, that tries to create new places and spaces. 
Now, it's encouraging, of course, at this moment that the Occupy movement has decided to take action and to bite the hand that hasn't been feeding us for 40 years. <laughs> but that biting uh, back uh, is not going to matter unless we can develop a generalized capacity organized around willingness, worthiness, and work. Willingness can't be nailed to the walls of a gallery or a museum. It's in there. It's across the hall. It's been on these screens. But it doesn't do its job when it's uh, held prisoner in these environments. Willingness has to be out in the world. It has to be generalized. It has to be out in what the Baptist preachers call out, out among the highways and the hedges. It has to circulate in the world. It has meaningful work to do. It can't do it in isolation. And this brings me to the art that Ramiro Gomez has been putting up around town. He's an installation artist who creates figures that exist in real space. Uh, before a house is even constructed on the west side, uh, Ramiro has put a, a paper a image of a, a man with a leaf blower there. The house hasn't been built, the residents aren't even there, but the leaf blower is there. And the leaf blower in two senses, the, the tool held by a man, but also the individual who's probably known to the people in the house as a leaf blower, not as a person. <laughs> and Romero creates these images by having people without faces. He's documenting, uh, in some ways, people who are undocumented in the sense that they don't have uh, papers or they've you know, they have expired work visas, but also what has been undocumented, and that is the ways in which the um, hard, low-wage labor of immigrants has subsidized the consumption lifestyles of the 1% in this society. And the invisibility that is part of uh, uh, the calculated cruelty of our time is part of what enables this to survive. That even in communities of color, we become uh, a shame of the presence of undocumented people, or we disavow all kinds of non-normative members of our own community. And what Romero has done is created works of art around town that ask us to confront uh, the person who does that work and to fill in the face ourselves. The women waiting on bus stops to go clean other people's houses uh, encounter images of themselves that Romero has put up there. One of my favorites is a street piece uh, on Sunset uh, in which there's an enormous hedge in which he's put two uh, cardboard uh, and paper workers uh, working on the hedge uh, as uh, uh, surrogates for the people who day in and day out work uh, those hedges. This kind of repopulation of L.A., this sense of asserting the worthiness, the work of uh, hard-working, uh, low-wage workers is tremendously important, both because it's a provocation in space, but also because it insists that um, uh, people have the right uh, to, uh, to work, they have the right to live, they have the right to seek decent wages, and it also puts in LA a, uh, a, a ghostly uh, reminder of the fact that it was the North American Free Trade Agreement, it was US capital penetration of Mexico and other parts of Central and South America that has created uh, basically the asset stripping, the centralization, the confiscation of land, the uh, forced migration of people to uh, low wage jobs in the US. Robert Alvarez, the anthropologist, notes that in 1980, uh, the U.S. consumed, imported no mangoes. Uh, today, the United States is the leading mango importer in the world. The people who didn't eat mangoes in 1980 are still not eating them today. The U.S. is the leading importer of mangoes because its capital penetration in, uh, in Mexico, in uh, Peru, uh, in Africa, in Asia, has forced the people who used to grow and consume mangoes overseas to come to the U.S. and buy mangoes in supermarkets inside the U.S. And so we are now the leading mango importer in the world uh, as one of the collateral consequences 
of the uh, uh, exportation of capital, the rise of low-wage jobs, almost all of which are in service industries designed to subsidize the um, uh, privileged, propertied white middle class home. In order to be reminded of this, in order to make visible what's invisible, in order to deepen the democratic strata that will be needed over the next 25 years, in order to help develop our own awareness of, uh, other, uh, of, of the need to make LA a place where everybody is somebody, in order to deepen the democratic strata in which the leadership <coughs> of low-wage workers will be crucial, Ramiro Gomez's art is tremendously uh, uh, important. It's tremendously uh, uh, needed because I think most of all what it does for me is remind me not only of the presence and of the uh, necessary work done by low wage, wage workers, but also that these workers know something that the rest of us need to know. Mm -hmm. They're first-hand witnesses to the realities of exploitative low wage labor. They're first-hand witnesses to sexual harassment. They're first-hand witnesses to criminalization and language discrimination. They're first-hand witnesses to what war and empire uh, really means, not the way it appears in the video games, but what it means in the lives of men and women around the world. And so I think that one of the things that uh, always strikes me when we see the art of the Chicano movement uh, there's, of course, isn't one way to make Chicano art, and there are a million different forms, and the range of art that we've seen today that Tomas mentioned, and Sean Noriega has always uh, championed the diversity, the plurality, uh, the moving across sectors of Chicano art. But this element of it, this element of willingness, this willingness to get up, this willingness to confront, this sense of being worthy to occupy space is, I think, more needed now uh, than ever and in the art of Ramiro Gomez, in the art of people whose names we know and names we don't know, it's being thrown forward. And we might wish that it were otherwise. We might wish that we could sit back and be satisfied that, we're, that this art is now in galleries, that artists who, um, whose native language is Spanish and who don't look or sound like the people who used to be credentialed by the art world are now honored and respected. And those, those are not unimportant uh, victories. And we need, to, we need to savor them. And we need to remember that it was grassroots work that made them possible. But at this particular moment in time, we have urgent work to do. And I think there's art all around us that can give us the willingness to do it.